Boxing King Media, powered by BYD. We're at the showroom once again out here in Sheffield. Uh, I tell you what, if anyone wants to join us for one of these podcast filming sessions, they're more than welcome to come along. It depends how interesting they are. They've got to be interesting, aren't they? They'll, They'll get ruined. Yeah. We'll get them, they can ask questions. Come down, come down, get, get in, get in, sit in the hot seat. Yeah. I've, come I've, down. That's I've, a good I've, shout, that is. That's that a good shout. We'll, yeah. get, we'll let, say, three people in and they can ask questions if they want to yeah. join in. Uh, but we're back here again, guys, for uh, another podcast episode. Um, uh, you know what, what I want to start with? Uh, I think Dom want to put you on the spot. The last time we spoke, we was here a few weeks ago. You know, um, it was just myself and you, and we spoke about Fury, Usyk, and um, we got a lot of heat in the comments because people felt that you weren't giving enough credit for I think I've, Usyk. I think I've always said that, you know, Usyk's a good fighter, and... You know, he's the unified heavyweight champion of the world. That's not the point. The point, I'm always going to defend the British fighters, Arna. That's what I'm going to do. But we want to unbiased you. It's not really about bias. I'm just, I just say, is it is, like I said, look. You, you said. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I the biggest thing people picked up was you said that he, he wasn't fit enough and then he should have just boxed him long. I, I, I do you know what? Do you know what people said? That eight, eight is eight pe months people, Yeah, but, but yeah, so you've got eight months for a fight. What, you've been training for eight months? Of course you haven't been training for eight months. I'm a boxing coach. I know some top-level fighters who've trained for eight weeks for a fight, six weeks for a fight and took a risk. So just because he's been given eight weeks' notice for a fight doesn't mean that Tyson Fury has been training for, for eight months. When he had that cut... He had a four-week break. He weren't training for that four-week break. He was in Saudi Arabia. I think he went to Thailand. He took a, he took four weeks out. I, I, th I think in saying that, I think that must have been some inside knowledge of that because on the outside, when I saw that, I'm like, that's, that's the fittest I've seen Tyson look. Yeah, he so when he said he's not been training, I'm no, thinking no, that's, no, a fittest, that's a fittest. That's the fittest he's ever looked. But then it's Tyson as an individual. Well, is he in the gym? Or is he thinking, I'm having time out and nobody can tell me anything? So when you said that initially, I just thought, Dom, what, what are you talking well, about? Well, let's look at it this way. If I, if I bring the nutritionist works for Tyson Fury, Tyson gets cut. And don't forget, Greg's been over in, you know, training in Saudi, training in Morecambe with him. And then he's not there for four weeks. So if Tyson's not on the, the nutrition plan for four weeks, he's not training properly, is he? It's as simple as that. Because is, is Greg with him now? No, not yet. No, well, he might. I don't know what's happening because I haven't really spoke to him. But what I'm saying to you is when you were in a camp, you see, you trained all year round. You were in the gym at four o'clock every day, regardless of whether you had a fight or not, every single day. When you had a title fight, you trained twice a day. And the only time you took time off was spring break and you mm. went abroad. I always, you, always did, you went to Orlando. That's what, that was your routine for 20, mm. 15 years. But fighters these days, all our fighters did that. They all trained all year round, so fighters now come in for a camp because some of them keep themselves relatively fit, some don't. So it's no good saying, well, he had all this month's notice. Yeah, well, that's not how it works in boxing, unfortunately. You know, it, boxers are the hardest people to train because they, they think, well, you know, I can just edge this one, I, I, I can take a risk. I know plenty who've done it. Johnny, I, I brought the point that Tony Bellew said, and a few fighters have said this, that Usyk's got this skill where he mentally drains you by walking you down and before you know it, you, you're gassed out. Well, well that's, that, you that, tell me. that's mental and physical. So mentally, if he's saying he mentally drains you, that, mean, that, 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 that means your mind is creating a narrative that, that is getting you, because he's not got any mental strength of it. It's like the physicality. And I'll always say, Tony Bellew was actually beating Usyk before he got done. Paul, Tony Bellew lost, when he got to the point he thought, fuck it, I can't do any more. Well, actually... You weren't swearing them, were you? So, yeah. Well, we're actually... Actually, I bet Tony's kicking himself, thinking, you yeah, know but what? And, and it's the same with it's the same with T Tyson Fury. It was about mentality. So the physicality of both fighters, both fighters got fit, both fighters have knowledge, both fighters had a game plan. It's just that his hustle beat his hustle. It beat Tony Bellew's hustle and it beat Tyson's hustle. So when they talk about the mentality, that don't mean shit to me. You know, it's when you get in there. I got in there. I'm quite sure I got with a lot of guys that will probably met a lot. Uh, but uh, probably about as fit as me, but they weren't mentally stronger than me. Once I knew how to win, no matter what they did, I thought, I'm not coming out of here a loser. So when talk of, people talk about he mentally puts you under pressure, that doesn't mean shit to me. What, what are you saying about the fact that Dom doesn't think that it was a case of Usyk walking him down, mentally tiring him out and physically tiring him out, and then obviously taking advantage of that? Uh, Dom's opinion is that Tyson just wasn't fit, that's why he couldn't do the full I, I, So then Dominic's talking from a trainer's point of view. I'm talking from a, an ex-fighter's point of view and my, what I see. And what I see is Tyson Fury 
his hustle wasn't as good as uh, Usyk's hustle because also Usyk, Usyk has never been in so much trouble in a fight. I think physically, I have never seen him look so fit, so on it. But that, if that's not engaged with that, it doesn't matter how fit you are. And, and that was Tyson's problem, that and the people around him, the team around him, that was his problem. But Dominic's saying that, he's saying it from a trainer's point of view. He got, he got some, uh, do you think the heat was justified in the comments? You know what, one thing I learned from Dominic, I think we did two of these, uh, about the last two sessions we did, and he said, you talk a lot about things you're not bothered about. So in reality, I don't, this heat what you got, I actually, I take a leaf out of his book and think, just ignore it, you know, I, he's addressing it because you're asking the Everybody, question. Everybody's going to have, look, everyone's going to have an opinion. And I don't think, you know, Tyson was the fittest in that fight. Um, and it doesn't mean you're right. I think no, that's, that's the key it, thing. It's, it's not even about whether I'm right or wrong. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. It's just my opinion and it might be totally wrong. I'm just saying what I see as a trainer and what I know from people training and looking at Usyk. Usyk's, Usyk's, Usyk, Usyk, Usyk's older than, than Tyson. Tyson's younger. Mm. Usyk's got to get to the top of that mountain because he wants to be every world champion. Tyson's already been there. And I always remember you saying, when you're trying to get to the top of that mountain, it's a challenge. And then when you got to the top of the mountain, you stayed there for a very long time, like seven years, and you're constantly looking behind you, thinking, who's going to try and take me off the top? Mm. It's a different type of pressure. So Tyson's lived the life at the top of the pile, got the money, millions, got the lifestyle. And it's like anything else. The courtiers keep you fat and happy to keep you in your place. You're the champ. You're the best. Because everybody's having a spin-off of it. Yeah. And then when you get beat, everybody just walks off and you're sat there on yourself. It happened with Nazim Hamid and all his family. So Usyk still had that hunger because he hadn't achieved that. So it was always going to be, he's always going to be more motivated. And in the middle of rounds, when Tyson started giving it him and he started looking out of sorts of Usyk, he did for about two or three rounds, you could see Usyk just thinking, it's a do or die situation. I've got to chew down on my gum shield and dig in here. And you can see Tyson thinking, well, I've given it the best I've got now. And he's still coming at me. Yeah, because Usyk's fitter. And a, a, a guy like Usyk, you, you can easily gas somebody like Tyson Fury by constantly keeping him under pressure, making him work, making him throw shots they don't need to throw. And the shot that actually sets it all up is the shot that any trainer and any boxer knows what's coming. The left hook off the backhand of a southpaw. And right. you think of the distance he's got to actually throw it. He's got to get past Ty Tyson's reach. And then he's got to loop it from his back ear to hit him. And it's a difficult shot to hit somebody with us, somebody as tall and as long as, as Tyson. And Tyson didn't manage to stop him cl closing that distance down. He should never have got it with that shot. He should never have even got it with Usyk's left hand. The only thing what should really have hit Usyk, uh, Usyk should have hit Tyson with is a right jab. Mm. That's all he should have hit, and maybe possibly a right hook. And Tyson's got the height and the reach advantage to keep him at distance, although that's all he had to do. So, so in saying that, it tells you then, so is it a physical thing or a mental thing? I'll always put it down to a mental thing. I think Tyson Fury is fit enough. I think Tyson Fury, again, like everybody could see, you saw him in the Ungarno fight, where he said, I trained to the best of my ability. You saw him in that fight, two different beings. So, so if, he's got, if you're going to tell a lie, you're going to have to fall on your sword. So, so, so in reality, I think it's that. And, and, and as Dom says, it gets to the point where you, you've done so well, you've achieved everything, nobody, nobody's telling you you're doing wrong, you want to do this, because you want to stay in a job. Are we taking any credit away from Usyk by... Not at, at all. No, Usyk showed heart, he showed desire, he showed want, and he showed persistence, and he thought, I'll die in here first. Tyson Fury wasn't prepared to. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that, and I hope that kind of explains uh, your viewpoint uh, from what you were saying last time, Dom. Um, we'll actually settle on Usyk. As you can see in the middle, people will be wondering what on earth is that. That is a signed glove by Alexander Usyk. Uh, you would have seen the interview that we did with him exclusively a few weeks ago. He signed that glove on camera. Um, and as part of uh, this partnership with BYD here in Sheffield, we're going to give that glove away to one lucky winner. Um, I think they've got it roughly priced. If you were buying that, it cost you thousands. I'm not even going to put a price on it, it cost you thousands because he doesn't sign uh, gloves. Um, it's framed up, nicely done. Um, to win it, you've basically, we're going to put a post out on Instagram. Uh, the details will be out on our Instagram account, hopefully in the next 24 hours at Boxing King Media. Uh, and all the information on how you can win the glove will be on there. Uh, but you'll have to ultimately follow the BYD Lookers account. Uh, Johnny, what do you reckon of the glove? I reckon we put, we announced the winner uh, at the weigh-in for the Dubois 
uh, AJ fight next Friday um, uh, in London. So you do an interview and then whoever's got it, I don't know how you're going to pull the winner. Uh, whoever's got it, it's got obviously got to be UK based. Yeah. Keep, keep uh, it's got to be UK only. Yeah, uh, whoever's well, got it, we'll do it that way. And um, But it's a, it's a good, if you're a boxing fan... Come it's on. a good thing to have. Yeah, it's a good thing to have. Uh, what I might also do is, for the winner, because I think Usyk is coming down for the fight next week, I might even get him to do a shout-out for the winner. Um, oh, that'd be good. That, yeah, that'd shout-out and the gloves. So, uh, moving on, I um, want to talk about the big fight announced uh, a couple of days ago. O'Hara Davis is fighting Adam Azim. Uh, we're going to be there tomorrow at the press conference. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Dom. What do you what do you think of that? Because initially there was talk of him fighting Dalton Smith. They obviously pulled him out of that fight. Um, then he was going to fight Harlem Eubank. There was a face off in the ring, and then from what Harlem's point of view, uh, they kept uh, changing the dates. And then obviously he didn't want to wait around, so he's gone in a different direction. And Adam Azim, they've pulled out O'Hara Davis, who on paper is a is a top twenty, top ten world level fighter. Yeah, but I go on his last fight and he got done in what around. So he got cold against a big, big punch. Mm. Yeah, well, like I say, is he? You know, what's he been doing in that time? I mean, I know you think it's a big fight, but like I look at a horror Davis, he's a tough kid. You know, a lot of controversy in his career. I look at his last fight and the build-up and the way he went out, and you know, as he got to that point now where he doesn't care anymore, and he's took this fight as a money job. He might, he might give Adam Azim a couple of problems, uh, and if I think if Azim kind of, you know, solves them early on, it'll be, you know, it'll be a win for Azim. Uh, it's going to be, uh, his, it's going to be his experience against Adam Azim's inexperience. And if O'Hara Davis can kind of blag it an old man his way through it, that's what he'll try and do. But Azim's a bit too fresh. He's the kid coming through. And it is a bit of a breakthrough fight for him in a sense, because he's quite, a, you know, on his past performances of Ara Davis, he's quite a, a difficult opponent. Maybe it's going to lead Azim into a false sense of security with him, you know, losing in a round, thinking, well, I can do the same thing. But, and that's where the problem could be for Adam Azim. If he thinks I can do the same thing and he can't, tries and does that, he'll probably get caught out. And maybe, uh, you know, Ara Davis is aware of this. But, you know, if. O'Hara Davis has applied himself correctly, you know, for this fight. And if he's had enough notice and he's trained hard enough, yeah, he could possibly, you know, cause Adam Azim a lot of problems. But if he hadn't and he just thought, well, you know, it's a big payday, I just go in there and fiddle my way through it, then, you know, that's going to be a different version of events. Um, it's an ideal opportunity for O'Hara Davis to cause an upset, but it's just whether he's got the mentality to do it. Johnny O'Hara's got 18 knockouts and Adam's only had the 11 or 12 fights. So he's had more knockouts than he's had fights. His losses have come against, like I said, got caught cold against Barossa. Prior to that, only lost to Josh Taylor and Jack Cattrall. So he's lost that world level. So, so, so he's saying that, he says whenever he steps out of his level or steps up a level, he gets turned over. So uh, if I don't know if Adam Azim is that level or not. Okay, so if Everybody's Adam, saying he is though, aren't so, they? So if Adam, Adam Azim is that level, you know, go by form, O'Hara Davis will be found wanting. Uh, and I, I think timing is everything. I think uh, it, on paper it'll be a great it'll be an, a great win for Adam, but in reality, where does it stand? Because if this if this was a O'Hara uh, Davis of a few years ago, it would have been a tougher fight. I still think it's going to be a tough fight, but I do believe that Adam has that special. That's enough to beat O'Hara Davis. O'Hara Davis has experience uh, and, and the wisdom and the miles on the clock to give him a hard time if he doesn't have his wits about him. But I think it's a good fight. I think Adam gets the job done. You know what, I, I could see it going going long, but, but in reality, I think Adam's too sharp, too fast, and probably the referee will probably have to jump in and, 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 and save O'Hara from himself. Uh, but I just think you look at his record, whenever, whenever, whenever he stepped out of his league, he's been turned over. So if Adam is the fighter we think he is, uh, um, then, then it should be enough. And, and you've got to think, if Adam's not the fighter he is, should be yet, at the level he's at, might be enough to beat O'Hara Davis because O'Hara's coming down. Is it a harder fight than Harlem Eubank? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. And that, that, don't disrespect to, um, uh, to Harlem. Uh, but I think, you again, if you put O'Hara in with, with Eubank, then, then, you know, I'd probably side with O'Hara. Uh, so, so let's just wait and see. He got a lot of criticism for obviously being pulled out the Dalton Smith fight. Does this kind of redeem that a little bit? Because I, I find it hard for the fighters because they take the flak, the, the the business 
side of our, our game uh, affects on the fights. I'm quite sure many times when Anthony Joshua should have been in a fight, you know, it looks like it's AJ's fault, but it's the business, it's, it's matchroom, it's whoever. You know, in this situation here, it's not Adam's fault these fights have fallen through. It's about negotiation in the back room. It's about what's happening with Boxer and whoever else they're negotiating with, or what's happening with on the other side of the fighters. Nine times out of ten, fighters want to fight each other. Uh, but but you, you, sometimes we have to be safe from ourselves. And they'll say, you know what, just take the heat. You're just going to have to step out of this. Let's, let's revert back. Let's just put this in comparison. It's, it's no different to what happened 20, 30 years ago. You can't blame Adam Mazim and Dalton Smith for doing what they've done. When he was coming through, he had an area title fight against Cole Thompson for the area title. Oh, my God, I forgot about that. And the purse bid <laughs> was £1,000. Yeah. yeah. That was way back then. a bit for that. Managers. And he had, a, he, had a, he, had a, he had a manager called Thompson, called Nat Basso, and my dad was Johnny's manager. He said, and we wanted the fight. And Nat Basso turned around and said, no, we're not doing that fight. It's a derogatory purse offer. We're not having that fight. And it's a good job he did. Because the box, whatever it were, said 10 years later, mm. for a world title fight, and you know, so much more money. So back then, yeah, we needed the fight because we needed to step Johnny up. They didn't need the fight. And imagine if the editor took that fight then. So he ended up in a world title fight. So the thing with boxing, it's not like league football where everybody plays everybody. You've got to weave your way through and make the best choice for the fighter. And sometimes mm -hmm. the fighter doesn't know what's the best choice for him. It's usually a good manager or a good promoter. And somewhere down the line, you know, that Dalton Smith and him will make a bigger fight somewhere else. You know, it's, it, it might end up in Saudi. It, it might do, but it's not, you know, there's, there's very few prospects meet at the British title level. I'll give you another example, Jazza Dickens and Kid Gallagher at the time when they boxed. Realistically, they were bought, whoever lost that fight were going to be set back a couple of years, which happened to Jazza. So, you know, you can build fighters, and you look at the, the big fights of the past, Ben Eubank and everything else, they box when they did box each other, they all boxed in world title mm. fights, not a British title level. And there were loads of people bypassing British titles and going to Europeans and getting the way through and then making a 10 times bigger fight down the line in a, in a world title fight. So, you know, the fans might not be happy about that, but they're both young. Oh, well, Dalton, yeah, Dalton Smith's still 26, 27. Adam Azim's how old? Uh, 20. 20. Yeah, yeah, so there's time, and, and time will suit Adam Azim because he's younger. You know, once Dalton starts getting to 28, 29, 30, he's got bad hands. You know, he's got to think about when's this fight going to be ideal for me. And the longer it goes on, it's going to be less ideal for him and more ideal for Adam Azim. So it would make sense as the younger fighter. He's got time to waste and sit back and, and mature. Whereas Dalton and so Dalton might have to take that fight when he don't really want to take it. And it'll, you know, certainly suit Adam Azim. To say matchmaking is as important in, in any fighter's career than anything else. You're yeah. match, the, your matchmaker, right, you develop them on the way up to the top. And when they get to the top, I'm quite sure if you'd have looked at like, I don't know, Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis or uh, Lennox Lewis against Mike Tyson. So when they did fight, Evander and, 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 and Tyson were past the best. And so, and so was Lewis and Tyson when yeah, they were yeah, both. So, yeah, exactly. But, but if they fought earlier on, when Tyson was a, a, a bloody handful, then it would have been, I think, it would have been a different result. So matchmaking isn't important as, uh, uh, than anything in, in any fighter's career. I'm just curious, Johnny, what's your memory of that of £1,000 first bid? I remember, I do remember Brennan and was Nat Was uh, Not really, no. No, no, no. But my, my first purse was for £190, £190. Is that the deductions? Uh, yeah, no, so what we did on the way back, Brendan had like stop at the service station, and whoever thought had to buy food for everybody at the service station. So so out of £190, I probably ended up with about 120 quid. So and then so you think, if that was my very first purse, and you look at some of these kids that are signing one on for a mill, so, so people but don't... But you were getting fed. <laughs> yeah, that's what Brendan said, he'd say, he'd say, and, and you've got to put petrol in the car. So, uh, but... I think Dominic mentioned something uh, a few few pods ago when he said, you've got to appreciate the waiting, the queuing up. You've got to appreciate the experience of actually going through. And when you appreciate it, when the time comes to get in the, 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 the goods, the goals, you really appreciate it. So I'm to drive up the motorway and everybody, everybody that was there that get fed, you've got to pay for petrol. And you're thinking, 190 quid, that's all I'm getting. These are the things that you've got to you appreciate that make you a better person, better fighter uh, in the future. One time we sent him out to France to be a sparring partner for a guy, and the guy was fighting Terry Dunstan, Terry Dunstan for the European title. And Johnny was out sparring the French guy, who was a French Moroccan or something like that, who was yeah. going to fight Terry Dunstan. And Terry Dunstan pulled out of the fight about a week before. 
And I think Frank Warren was manager Johnny at the time. He said, oh, you can fight this kid, but don't say anything because you've been sparring him. And then they said to this French guy, like, you're fighting Johnny Nelson. And, and obviously Johnny never went out of his way to try and put these fighters in the place. He just kind of sat back and the kid was quite confident. But he did say, oh, I really don't want to fight you, Johnny, you're my friend. And, and they end up boxing. And, um, you know, Johnny had been sparring him the previous week. Then the following week he boxed him. And Johnny beat him, and I can always remember I was in the car and my dad didn't come, and Naz flew out in a private jet, That's and, right. That's and right. you know, <laughs> we win this fight. And I said to Johnny, he's going to go this round, Johnny, put it on him. I said, you can see his, all the distress signals are there. And Johnny went out and he hammered this kid, Somewhere. and the kid managed to survive, and he came back and went, I thought you, I thought you, were, I thought you said you were going to stop him. I went, next round. <laughs> Next round, Johnny went out and stopped him, and that yeah, way he's a European rounds. champion. Seven and rounds. that's how boxing is. I mean, you don't you don't hear stories like that these days. But that's that was commonplace yeah. back twenty and thirty years ago. You got a last minute call for you know a title fight. You know John Keaton turning up to box unbeaten prospect Gary yeah. Delaney in a in a twelve round title fight with three days notice. Talking of John Keaton, we're gonna try and get him here for one of the episodes. That'd be good. You know, you just man, you just reminded me of when Naz flew over in that jet. I think whoever jumped on the jet, everybody jumped on the jet. And uh, Naz, I don't know if he'd have been smoking some weed or something like that, I don't know, but he was sick after, when they got off the plane, and everybody's laughing. No, I think that was to do with the size of the plane, it was all over the place, because I think he, he was only a small passenger, you know, small, like, ten-seaters, weren't it, from Gamson Airport. Yeah, in, that's in, right. In, that's in right. Medford, was, whatever. We had, you used to have a right laugh, we yeah. used to have a riot, man. You know, you just mentioned weed there, going slightly off topic, I, I saw Derek Chisora put something up yesterday on, on his Instagram, asking Joe Joyce, that he owe me a... Um, you know, we, we need to meet up for this, you know, for this spliff of they're going to smoke and you put up a bag of weed on, on Instagram. Do fighters get tested for weed? Can you smoke weed? Yeah, yeah weed's not a, it's not, it's not it's on the, the ban list. list. It's not on the ban list. So you we, smoke weed the night before a fight? Mm, you won't do. You yeah, want to win. Uh, you, it's, <laughs> no, 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 no. You can't, no. You, 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 if, you, if you tested on the night of the fight, you had THC in your urine, you'd fail a drug test for boxing, it's not tested for in a training camp. So if they come and test you three or four weeks in a training camp, just like cocaine or whatever, you're not gonna get banned. You would on board and not on UCAD, but on fight now, any any cannabis, cocaine, any kind of narcotic, whatever, you're gonna get banned. Mm. Because you've got to remember that it's not just for performance and enhancing drugs, it's also for drugs what are gonna affect your performance and put you in a bad way. So imagine you getting weeded up and going into a fight, and you're not like you're not fully aware that it's a dangerous place to put yourself in. Do you understand? So you know, well, same. A lot of people, a lot of fighters in Ryan Glass, he's spoken about it quite a bit. So yeah, but it's like it's look, not, definitely not encouraging anyone to. No, it's the wrong it's thing to be doing yeah, it's 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 not as a not boxer great. because we we once had a fighter that failed a brain scan, and and you know they went to the specialist, and the specialist turned and said, "This is synonymous with people who smoke weed." Not to get him punched around there, because there's certain certain parts of the brain it affects. He goes, and this is synonymous. This 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 scan is synonymous with a heavy weed smoker. So that just shows you. So anybody who's out there who's boxing who smokes weed, yeah, it's not a great idea. Mm. Just get, like, last question on that money side of things. You know, you said you was getting 190 quid. What was it like for the trainer to pick up like say 20? Yeah, but hours. back in those so days, you're getting thirty quid. For yeah, but back in those days, we had we had a lot of fighters. Johnny was just coming through. Johnny was rubbish as an amateur. He, he had about ten fights, and we did. Say something about that, Johnny. He's trying. He, he says he's, he's like. <laughs> but the thing is, when you, you know, he always used to look terrified, and I used to think, why does he want to do it? But sometimes people have to test themselves and put themselves in that situation. Think, well, yeah, I don't want to be here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Face the fear and do it anyway. And then I remember after so many fights, my mum said, "You're wasting your time with him, Brendan." And he went. <laughs> You know, best thing for you, Johnny, you need to turn pro and you could see my mother looking around thinking, <laughs> Everybody's like, Ram! <laughs> what, what about just, what, what do you mean turn pro? He's not even good enough to be an amateur. But actually, it was the making of him to turn, to turn professionally. It actually suited him better. So my dad actually had the foresight to say, Yeah, you know what? You'll be better in three minute rounds over a longer period of time. You'll get your time to warm up. And, and he weren't wrong, uh, so... Uh, and, and the other thing is, you know... So he didn't do it, he didn't do it for the 190 because there were yeah. that many kids boxing. My dad was just glad to be out and about yeah. getting people jobs and having the crack. And, and the, the other thing is, and I can remember Brendan having the conversation, there was a few of us in, he said, if, if, if I'm on 25% and you're on, on £400, how much do I get? £100. He said, so if I'm on four, you're on four grand, how much do you get? A grand. He said, so if you're on four million, how much you get? How much you get? A million. And I said, no, no, no chance. You know, that's kicked off and that, Brendan said, you bastard. But, but what I'm saying is people forget the hard work you do in the beginning 
it pays off in the end because when the big money comes in the end, all of a sudden all the vultures come out of the shadows. So you don't want to be giving this, you don't want to be giving that, forgetting all the mileage they've put in, all the days when they've, it, it's actually cost them to be with you at the beginning of your career when you're making not a penny. And so, and people develop amnesia of that. Yeah. And it, 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 it's not just happened with Brendan, it happens with many, many coaches and managers. A deal's a deal. So, so my deal with Brendan was a deal. So the same deal we did at the beginning was the same deal we did at the end. There was no nudging it because that's the deal. Uh, but unfortunately, and that's when people fall out, they forget all the hard work, all the charity work realistically. Because if I'm getting paid 190 quid, I'm paying for the petrol, I'm paying for the food on the, on the service, at service stage you're coming back. Brendan's probably walking about about 25 quid and he usually gave most of his money away as on, on the sub story. So he's doing it for nothing. So, so that's just not just me. There's, so I actually came in that first fight. I think he did get twenty five quid. And he got give us a five for each. He goes, "What's that for?" He goes, "Johnny Nelson boxed last night. There were five of us in family, five kids, and he gives a five for each, twenty five quid. So that was money gone, and we thought yeah. they were great five and, quid. And, and that's what that's what I'm saying. So people do not realise what happens behind the scenes. They see these big time fighters living a large life. What about the the people that are giving their time for nothing? You know, giving that, giving that, giving their patience for nothing. The patience is more valuable than anything you can buy, you know, because they're giving you their time, which you can never get back. Did, didn't it ever bother you when, you know, like Dom said there, you know, Dom's mum used to say, like, well, why does he need to box as a pro for? You would have seen and people saying this about you. Yeah. You're not bothered? They didn't say it behind my back, they said it to my face. I know. But actually, to me, to, to, but you, you don't understand, face. I went to the gym to make friends. The downside of going to the gym was having to you box. Yeah, to have a fight. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to box. You know, I'm thinking, we'd go on the bus towards a fight, to a fight, and I'd hear people like Paul Silky Jones talking about knocking somebody out, and I'm like thinking, oh my God, how'd you do that? And, mm. and, and, we'd, and, I'm, and, and I'd have the conversation, why am I here? But I kept coming back. And I don't know if Brendan saw that, you know, don't you thinking, why are you coming? I have no idea why it kept coming back. But now in the long term, I look back and I'm thinking, that was my path. You know, that was my path. I just didn't know it. Definitely so. Uh, and just a quick plug I'm going to give. I met a fighter yesterday, Adrian King, who was trained by Curtis Woodhouse. Uh, I'm not saying it's the same story as yours, but a similar sort of story. Unbelievable story. young heavyweight uh, coming through. Really good fighter, 19 year old. He's massive. He's absolutely huge. Same size as Anthony Joshua. He, he, modeling, modeling he, he sparred with Sheldon McDonald. Sheldon's training, uh, I think he's got a Central Area title fight on the, tw on the end of the month. He sparred with Sheldon. Sheldon said, This kid is good. He's on fire. Sheldon's had. A, a child is technically a very good fighter, but this young man, Sheldon, rates him massively. And he was, he said, you know, out of box, because he can bang, and he's, he's a handful. Now, if this kid's like this, and he's not had one professional fight yet, can you imagine, all of a sudden, you know, I said to kids, be careful, because as soon as people know who he is, you're going to have problems, and the ninjas are going to come out. And that, that's what I'm. I think the, the main thing is boxing aside, he's a really nice young man, so I wish him all the best and I urge people to follow his journey, yeah. uh, Adrian King. Uh, and then Belanga Canelo, or should I say Canelo Belanga this weekend. Belanga, young upcoming, uh, well, he's not young upcoming anymore, but he had that uh, knockout streak where he was knocking everyone out in the first round. They stepped up his opponents and then I think he won a few uh, on points, but I think he won his last one by knockout. He's got the Canelo gig this weekend. Uh, giving him a chance well you know canel's at the stage now in his career where he won't be taking fights where he's going to be putting himself in any position to get beat i mean he's not he's not one of the champions is he, this kid so canelo's kind of playing it safe and if, if canelo's got anything left he should deal with him quite easily um so you know it's it's a it's a safe enough fight but you never know do you because you know fighters can all of a sudden get old, old overnight, as they say. And, you know, there's always a danger when you've been fighting at that level that you, you take fighters beneath you lightly. It's happened loads of times. I remember one time Errol Graham, he boxed a guy called Frank Grant, and Frank mm. Grant should never, ever have been in the ring with Errol Graham. And a combination of him, him training out of his skin and Errol Graham, you know, thinking, well, this is going to be easy enough. Errol Graham got beat. Mm. Um, so I that's why that you can never you can never underestimate. You've got to train for every fight like it's going to be the hardest fight you know you're ever going to have. So it'll be interesting and it'll give you a bit of an idea of where Canelo's at, at this point because what's in there 32, 33 is he? So we'll have to wait and see on that, that one. That was that was Ellen Road. Yeah. Uh, Henry Henry Wharton, Wharton, uh, Henry Henry Wharton, Wharton, yeah. And uh, Harold Graham box Frank Grant. Do you give Belanga any chance in this fight? We give any man a, a chance, and I, I I agree with Dom. I don't. I think. Canelo's in a position where I think he beats 97% of the fighters in the world at the moment. 
he's not the fighter he was, but the fighter he is beats 97% of the fighters that are out there. And he's and he's in the, he's, he's in he's in own little own little bubble. So so I give him a chance, but a very slim one. Uh, and the last thing I want to speak about before we go into the predictions for next week's uh, big show. Uh, Last week when I spoke to Dom, um, we spoke about Chris Eubank Jr.'s comeback, obviously his selection of opponent. Um, Dom's opinion was that he, at his level, and considering what he's done, he shouldn't be handing warm-up fights, he should just go jump in, into a big fight. I think Hamza Shiraz said something similar in an interview uh, that he did the other day. Uh, Johnny, you're technically the Chris Eubank business I, I, uh, So I think Chris Eubank is has got the right hang on it. I think he's he's treating this business, this sport, as a business. So he's going to do what's best for him. Take the criticism, take the flat. He'll pick the fights, and 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 you know what, and create conversation and opinion. If he's good, he's bad. You're still you're going to watch it. And so he's. I, I think Chris is a decent fighter. I think he's a good fighter. And he and 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 you know and you'll, you'll get that professional jealousy from other fighters thinking, well, what's he done? So you think about what he's done, what he's achieved, to where he is. He's done really well. He's done really well because he gets paid handsomely. He's in a position where he's not tied to anybody in particular, and and he's like in a in a choice to pick and choose. What's he got to negotiate with? Apart from that aura that is created around him, so Chris, I, I, I think Chris is, is doing everything right, business-wise and sport-wise. Rumours that Billy Joe is going to come back and. and fight. Uh, Billy's been talking about it for a while though, and it'd be good. But Billy's been talking about that for a while. I think Billy is talking about coming back because he's bored, um, uh, and that's it. And if Billy really wanted to come back, he'd have boxed by now. I, I think it's a great idea. It's great romance in it, but do I think it'll happen? No, I don't. Uh, I like Billy. Uh, I think he's bored. And, and, and everybody in, in our fight game, you think, I want to do it, I want to do it. Then you're in a hard training camp, you think, it's not worth it. You know, I, I think Billy, in his head, he's romancing the idea. But in reality, do I think he'll happen? No, I think he's bored. I think before we go, uh, Dom, you know, last time me and Johnny were here, we jumped in the BYD Dolphin. You tried to put me in the boot. What are you talking about? I tried about? to put Johnny in the boot. Uh, <laughs> and he would have fit in as well, but he was too scared to do it. But today, I'm going to look at this one, the BYD Atto designer uh, what's interesting to say uh, as well I know a lot of the people that watch our content got businesses uh, their own companies and what I've been told by the people at BYD BYD are selling out all the EV car companies in the UK right now uh, people are buying the fleet cars which you can write off as tax uh, the best tax rate we were all having a conversation before and we're, we're complete we've come turned around completely before we got into an electric car I would never nah not chance in a million years now I can't see it being any other way uh, um, and, and to be in an electric car, especially so to be spoiled with one of these cars. My range is like 130, 330 miles in, in my car, you know. And so to be spoiled like that, you forget what it's like to go into a petrol station. I pull in, I pull up a pump to go and get a bag of crisps. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, so, so the convenience, if you plan it right and you've got a car with good range, you're laughing. Johnny, like, where, where can you charge your phone? You're in bed and you're on your app. Yeah. I've even had a charger installed in mine. It's cost me a fortune. You know, you got yours for free because you blagged it. <laughs> but I've actually got a charger installed yesterday on an app, laid in bed, yeah, between 12 and 5, it's cost me 7p a minute. Yeah. And it's all, like I claim it on my business, it's, all t it's a free car for me. And like Sam, the same, you know, not giving it the big sell. I've still got my, my diesel car, but when it you feels get like into a tank, it, when it feels like it. a tank. But <laughs> this car, it, the, the so smooth, you know, I mean, the, the, the amount of car you get for the money is unreal. And I'm glad we've had them, you know, for this period of time and, and they're doing really well. Um, you know, you, you won't look back. And my kids are saying, oh, you know, we have one of them cars. I'm saying, well, we might do. But it's a no-brainer at the minute. Yeah, the cost is massive. You know, you touched on it there. To get... To See, it costs, it costs, it costs seven pence to fully charge my car for that's 320... That's seven, um, uh, uh, seven pounds. Oh, sorry, sorry, not seven, seven yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, so we said seven pence, whatever it were, seven kilo. pence a kilo. Yeah, and, and out, yeah, seven pound to get three hundred plus miles. Yeah. So to basically to get three hundred miles in a diesel car, you're going to spend fifty, sixty, yeah, yeah. Like Range Rover maybe yeah. eighty, ninety quid. Yeah. But you're going to get seven pound, three hundred miles. But you, know, so you know, you know, people obviously banging on a lot. I've had a lot of people messaging me. Oh, you know, it's wrong. This electricity and everything else. It's, it's it produce electricity, but aren't we up to percentages? So. It's like, yeah, we've got a lot of green energy going into the grid. You've got, you've got solar panels. You've got wind power. They are developing. 
other ways to, to produce electricity. And that realistically, when you think about it, you see, go past people's houses, and they've got little solar panels mm. for powering the outside lights. People have got little wind turbines in. Eventually, when you look at, when you look at technology these days, the way now the, the, the harnessing natural energy to produce electricity, well, you know, fair play. It might take a few years. It might take a few years. But, like I say, I don't feel guilty about using an electric car um, by any... By any I, I, I do get a bit of flax and I can't believe you've got an electric I'm thinking, well, what? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Just, just, just do your research. You know, do your research yourself and look at it and think, look at the benefits. And, and at the end of the day, listen, I'm a tight horse. You know, and so to me, it's cheaper being in an electric car. End of. And it's End of. Like, it's, it's factual. Like I'm saving ten percent. You're saving like eighty odd ninety. Yeah. It's like you're saving a lot of money. Hey, do you know what? The, the best thing is, there's no service on them, is there? You don't have to have yeah. an oil change. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no oil change. There's no, no, no oil change. No brake pads. No brake pads. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know the, the only downside? I've actually had to put air in tyres. Have you? <laughs> I've had to put some air in. Yeah. That's That's I'm, I'm Come on, have a look. Let's check this car out. The BYD Atto Three. It's a little family car. Good Dominic in it. No, I won't be having one of these, I don't I think. I think both of you could jump in this, to be fair. Yeah, but if, if you look at it, £429 deposit, £429 a month. Like driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> to have this as a family car. It's, it's, it, it, right, this, guys, this is actually it, not this this is actually there's family plenty, look, There's plenty of room in there. Yeah. yeah. There's plenty of room. And. <laughs> Could be mind you back in the day, this, this driving down fights. Yeah, but we, you know, we had all kinds of cars, but I, my, I've got a, a Vauxhall Safira. It's, it's an old one, but it's, it's kind of this kind of build. But, you know, they're comfortable, these BYDs, and they're smooth. And I, I don't know what the power's like on this, but I like the seal. Uh, I, I, well, I think I'd have to do it by, by testing with my foot. But when you're in the seals, the acceleration is, is immense. Nobody will, can yeah. get you off. You're at a traffic light. Isn't it? And you, you're just off, and people looking. You can see people pulling up at the side and looking and thinking, what cars are you driving? Because you don't see many of them on the road. So I like. I, I'm going to stick with the BYD seal, but I'm going to have a. I'm going to ask if I can drive one of these and see what it's like for power wise, because it might be something when I buy one that, as a family car, I might end up buying one of these instead of like a saloon yeah. because yeah, it's going yeah. to be. It's going to fit me bikes I, on it. It's going to fit more space because I go camping a lot. So you you want a bit more boot space, don't you? Yeah, space is ridiculous as well. Yeah. It actually, look cool. This is yeah. what is this for? How much is it? With a four hundred ninety-nine pound deposit, you're paying four hundred what thirty pound a month for a car like this. Yeah. And even you know, as a business, if you're gonna have a car and a business lease, it's yeah. costing you nothing. Nice for free. Yeah, so that's all. So say if it takes five hundred pound, you're talking like just over a hundred pound a week uh, uh, to have a car like this. But you know what? I was out in I was out in Thailand last week, and you see everybody driving the big build posters BYD. Everybody's driving BYDs, electrics. You see them all over the place. You can't every every second or third. Well, every second, every third or fourth car's a BYD. You see them. Everybody's got them. So they're taking off big over there. And I think over here as well. You know, you've got you've got a couple of you've got the like you've got the uh, the other electric cars like Polestar and, and and the other ones and Dubai. Yeah, a lot of Martin Dubai. It's as worth well. mentioned Dom that he was in uh, Thailand unboxing business with clients. Oh yeah, he, yeah he of course. People yeah. assuming all sorts. Yeah, you well, yeah, no, we had some. Great, Thailand, well, that's the thing is we had we had two fighters on and we had two fighters in Dubai, so it was quite a successful trip. Yeah. But um, yeah, how's the, how's the diet going? Yeah, I'm busy with I'm, yeah, busy with the diets. Like I'm run over with the with the diets. It never stops, does it? But people keep asking why Dom's not training any fighters. It's because I ain't got, got time. I, do you know what? I am training fighters, but it's, it's in the, like I said, I've got a few uh, coming through, like young kids, who I'm going to spend time with. But um, there's so much more to be doing, isn't there? And I have had offers off other people wanting me to train them, but it's like anything else that I have to start matching now what I think those fighters are capable of. Is it worth me investing well, my time in you know, fighters? Yeah, and you know, for us ex-fighters that used to train under you and your dad, I think the hardest thing for us is that it, it's it's in our blood, it, 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 it's, it's, it's our passion. But for you, you were like you were like groomed into it. It's like it's, yeah. it's just like, it's a family. It's, so you'd look at it different as a business, where we, we're like it's, it's, well, to be, it's, to be honest, Johnny, that, that is a case to a certain degree. I, I did do it for that thing, but the thing is I liked, it's like with, with people I coach now for dieting and losing weight. It's all about moving people in life from A to B into a better place. And whether that's through boxing or through diet and nutrition, because realistically money is good, but there's, there's not, once you get to pass a certain point with money, there's no satisfaction in it because I'm not materialistic. So the biggest thing were for you, 
you were rubbish and you became a world champion and you went in Guinness Book of Records. That's a fan, that's something to talk about, not mm. the the hundreds of thousands that you made as you made yourself. That's like that's that's by the by. That's that forgot. You know, that's in a bank account. But you're in the Guinness Book of Records and you, this is your story. You've got a story. You know what I mean? And it's saying we killed Brooke. It's saying we killed Galahad. The stories. Like there's so much mileage in them stories. It's ten times better than the mm. money. Them journeys were great. It's, it's not. It's not the end result. It's the journey where you went along. That's where it is. And it's the same. So I got satisfaction out of you know get, helping people get to where they wanted to be because not everybody can get there on the self. And it's the mm. same with people I like date and coach. So when my dad though, my dad was purely for that. He were mm. interested in the money. He was interested in. Oh, he's done all right. He did better than when I was a professional. And he like he liked to bring kids yeah. through purely on that basis. So he he did it. Even with kids who were going to be no opers, it convinced them they could get somewhere where they might win one fight. These kids might be in a central area. I was one of them. Yeah, but, but you kept getting to the next level and the next level and the next level. So I think now, when you look back and you look how boxing is now and look at the fighters, that era now of the coaches spending that kind of time, everybody wants pain. And all the coaches out, coaches out there, they're too big coaches anyway, and they just want to be Instagram famous. Mm. You know what I mean? They're not they're not doing it, you know, because they're good coaches. There's a lot more poor coaches out there. There's an handful of decent ones there. There's an handful. Mm. And and soon there's not going to be any decent coaches coming well, I through. Saw, I saw a clip with Pete where uh, when Chris Eubank Senior said, you know, they're PE teachers. They've got the college, university, yeah. got them themselves. It's all about. Do you know yeah. what you what you're seeing now is, you'll see the kid winning, and then they'll be, you'll see the coach in the corner taking a selfie so they can put it on their Instagram. It's about yeah. them, and it's not about. It's never about the coach. It's it's about the fighter. You know, it's, it's secondary being you know uh, being a coach. So I'm just glad in them days when you were coming through and the rest of them, there was no social media because you might not have actually got you know where you wanted to be because you could have been insta famous before you were proper famous. So, like I say, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? And like I said, if uh, anyone wants uh, Dominic Ingle's uh, health and uh, tips on uh, losing weight and getting in shape, uh, if you look at the, both of these guys in 50 plus, looking in phenomenal shape, uh, hit I, actually think, don't crack, I actually think I could do you in a 5K now, <laughs> only, only because you've got no hips and knees left. Like, but. but yeah, hit up Dominic Ingle on the email address that we, we've always got on the screen as well. So, uh, so yeah, any final words before we let you go? You've got, look at the roof as well. You've got plenty of uh, this space. You're getting a lot in this yeah. car, aren't you? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Any final words from both of you? No, oh, that's uh, another one out of the way, isn't it? So, all good. Johnny? Uh, BYD, get yourself down here. Look at Sheffield. Uh, they've been really good to us, and uh, just come and have a look. Just come and have a look for yourself. If you, if you, you really have a look, because you'll be, you will be, you will be surprised. I mean, like I said, we were never bothered, were we? No. I remember when you got onto me and said, a, "They're doing this down at BYD," and I went, "I'm not bothered about electric cars, Johnny. Yeah, give me an engine any time." But we can just have a try, and you know what? I'm kind of sold on the idea. So you what? Get down. Dominic Ingle, Johnny Nelson. Another episode done at BYD. Thank you very much.